February 14th, 1929, Capone's men committed one of the most gruesome acts of gangland slaughter in the decade. When George Bugs Moran got wind of this incident, he was mortified. Moran himself was scheduled to meet with his men at the garage at that very moment of the massacre. He had run late and so was spared. The only survivor of the massacre when police arrived on the scene was Frank Kusenberg. Detailed at Frank's bedside in the Alexian Brothers Hospital, Police Sergeant Clarence Sweeney asked Gusenberg who shot him. His response? Nobody. Nobody shot me. Gusenberg died later that day at 1.30 p.m., tight-lipped. Moran, however, refused to be discreet about the incident. Obviously emotional over the massacre, Moran brashly broke the gangster code of silence in declaring, Only the Capone gang kills like that. The act was an open declaration of war and a wake-up call to the outraged public that beneath the veneer of the stylish gangster lived a snarling, deadly beast. It was three weeks before authorities had a list of suspects, but these leads would ultimately prove fruitless. Named as suspects in the killings were Joseph Lalordo, James Ray, and Fred Killer Burke, who allegedly performed the raid and massacre, and Jack McGurn and Jack Guzik, whom prosecutors argued had arranged the attack, McGurn having paid each of the men $10,000, and Guzik having consulted by telephone with Capone in the days before the massacre. McGurn and another Capone associate, John Scalise, were indicted on seven charges of first-degree murder, their bonds at $50,000 each. They were to be the only ones. By May of that year, Scalise had been killed when Capone learned of disloyalty, betraying Scarface to the rival mobster Joe Aiello, leaving McGurn to stand trial alone. Prosecutors and investigators worked tirelessly to bring a case against McGurn, but none was to be had. Just days after the massacre, even the coroner had been threatened, according to one news report. Coroner threatened with death to halt probe of massacre. Death threats are received twice within three days, official says, by phone and letter. New sensation is sprung in outrage that stirred entire country. Chicago, February 19. Coroner Herman N. Bundesen revealed today his life had been threatened twice in the past three days, which he attributed to his activity in investigating the St. Valentine's Day massacre of seven members of the Morgan gang. Sunday, Dr. Bundesen said he received an anonymous telephone call in which he was told, you will be next. You will be the next to go if you don't watch out. Yesterday, he said he received an anonymous letter asking him how he would like to kick the bucket. By December, the prosecution had to give up the ghost. The gunmen, two of whom were World War I veterans with more than enough experience with a Tommy gun, were either never apprehended or never found. McGurn would remain the only man ever indicted in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Six years later, an anonymous letter was sent to the office of J. Edgar Hoover regarding the massacre. It expressed a sentiment of lost faith in law enforcement, but it also represented a disdain and damnation of organized gangs and gangsters, as well as the violence and other social ills that they perpetuated. It seemed that the glamour was gone. Dear sir, now that the federal authorities have all the information leading up to the killers of the St. Valentine's Massacre, what action is going to be taken to mete out justice? Oh, I suppose there might be a technicality simply for the reason that what is left of the rats 
are now serving prison terms. And maybe poor John Law can't get in to persecute until after their time has been served. But this is where the law should be revised. An eye for an eye. And these hardened killers made to pay for their crimes strictly in accordance with the original interpretation of the law. What is going to be done about it? If this case is no longer in your hands, please pass this request for justice along to the proper department and oblige. Copies to the President of the United States and the Chicago Herald and Examiner. On the 13th of May, 1929, the Atlantic City Breakers Hotel, at the time restricted to white Anglo-Saxon Protestant clientele only, began to notice an influx of what the management perceived to be Jewish and Italian-looking guests checking in. The men, all registered under names that sounded Anglo enough, were refused admittance by the hotel staff. There was a scene in the hotel lobby as two men got into a heated argument, Nucky Johnson and Al Capone. Johnson had made all the arrangements for the guests, and the hotel's management did not know whom they were refusing. Some of the biggest names in organized crime from across the country. From New York, there was Johnny the Fox Torrio, Lucky Luciano, and Meyer the Brain Lansky. From Chicago, there was Al Scarface Capone, Frank the Enforcer Nitti, and Frank Rio. The ensuing argument between Capone and Johnson was later recalled by Lucky Luciano. Nucky and Al had it out right there in the open. Johnson was about a foot taller than Capone, and both of them had voices like foghorns. I think you could have heard him in Philadelphia, and there wasn't a decent word passed between them. Johnson had a rep for four-letter words that wasn't even invented. And Capone is screaming at me that I made bad arrangements. So Nucky picks Al up under one arm and throws him into his car and yells out, All you jokers, follow me! Johnson checked this motley delegation into the Ritz-Carlton and Ambassador Hotels. When Capone reached his hotel, he began ripping paintings off the wall and throwing them at Nucky. The Atlantic City Conference, the first step in the creation of the National Crime Syndicate, was off to a rousing start. After an initial two or three days of constant parties, with liquor supplied by the truckload, courtesy of Nucky Johnson, the Consortium of Criminals began to discuss business. The delegates held discussions about taking a larger interest in illegal and cooperative gambling activities, such as bookmaking, horse racing, and casinos. The New York and Chicago representatives laid out a plan to tie in the National Wire Service for horse racing bettors with the daily racing form and to lay bets throughout the United States. This idea was introduced to the conference delegates after Al Capone ran into Chicago's Moses Annenberg, who controlled the mob that enforced distribution of William R. Hearst's newspapers in the Chicago area. The families in New York and Chicago would oversee and direct operations for this cooperative and very lucrative venture. New York bosses Frank Costello and Meyer Lansky were chosen as directors to coordinate the operations along with Chicago representatives. New York's future king and gambling czar, Frank Erickson, was chosen to oversee the organization of the operation along with Chicago's Moses Annenberg. Businessman and underworld associate, Annenberg was not originally invited to the conference, but after running into Capone, the well-known Annenberg was most likely invited to confer with the leaders on business matters concerning 
the national race wire. It was agreed by the conference delegates that investments in the legitimate liquor business and gambling was the way to offset the loss of profits from the end of prohibition and discussions to divide the country into exclusive franchises and territories for the bosses and their gangs were started at the Atlantic City Conference. Another pertinent point of discussion was the ongoing violence and bloodletting that was occurring in Chicago. The underworld wars in Chicago and to some extent in New York had brought about a public and media outcry for law enforcement to stop the violence. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.